Hello everyone, it's Benny, and welcome back to the 3D game programming tutorial series. Last time, we built the game render context, the foundational cornerstone of our render pipeline. Today, we're going to take a look at how we can build an ECS design that can generally use this and generally lend itself to building a generic render pipeline that's easy to expand, easy to add, whatever we want to. That is the objective of this video. Let's get to it. So, now that we have our game render context, and now that it's doing pretty much what it's supposed to, let's build a system that can actually use this on our meshes. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a snuffer struct because we're making another component. I'm going to call this renderable mesh component. Sure. Public ECS component of renderable mesh component. There we go. And what do we need to define a renderable mesh? Obviously, we need a vertex array because that is a mesh. So, we have a vertex array. Sweet. What else do we need? Well, right now, the only thing we care about other than the mesh is the texture. So, we're going to take a texture pointer, texture. And both of these are going to start out equal to null. So that's great. Now we have renderable meshes. So what? Well, the next thing we need is we need a system that will process these in some form or fashion. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by copying my movement control system because this will be a nice base for building our renderable mesh system. So renderable mesh system, sure. Again, don't really have the best name for it yet, but that's fine. Right now, this is what it does. It takes renderable meshes and it renders them. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a private game con, sorry, game render context reference. I'll just call it context, sure. And that'll be one of the parameters we have to take in. We need to know about this context going into it, otherwise we're kind of screwed. So we need the base ECS system, we're going to set the context to context in, that should be our initialization. So what components do we need? We still need the transform component, we need to know where things are, but beyond that, all we really need is the renderable mesh component. So yeah, I'm just going to go to the renderable mesh component, that ID, change this pointer to renderable mesh component, and yeah, I'll just call this mesh, sure. That should get the job done. And we can get rid of this for loop because we're not doing anything like that in this particular video. So what about the context? Well, I'm going to do context.rendermesh because that's what we want to do. We want to render the mesh. We want to render the vertex array. So it'll be mesh arrow vertex array. And this wants to be a reference. This is a pointer. So, actually, does it? Yeah, this will be right. We need, the mesh is a pointer, so we point to the vertex array. The vertex array itself is a pointer, so we want to dereference it to get the actual vertex array to pass in. There you go. Then mesh texture, also dereferenced. And great, all we need now is the transform itself, which is very straightforward, transform dot to matrix there you go done we are completely done with the mesh renderable mesh system we can render the mesh yeah there you go we're done but now we need to actually use it so we can get rid of this vertex rate on update buffer we don't need any more we can get rid of this context draw we don't need any more but we do need is another ecs system list this is for our rendering systems Actually, I'll just call it, I'll just be completely blatant with it and call it the rendering pipeline because that's what it is. It's a rendering pipeline. And we're going to have a renderable mesh system. Renderable mesh system. Sure, I'll just. I don't have a good name for it. I just need to create it so I can add it to the rendering pipeline. That's the only point of this. We're going to add system, renderable mesh system. There you go. So what? 
What's the big deal? What does it matter? Why do we have this in a separate pipeline? It's actually very simple. We don't want to update the a renderable mesh system every single time we update. The whole point of this paradigm with the updating here and the rendering here is to keep game logic and rendering separate. Only render when it's actually necessary to render the scene. There's no need to render just because something in the game logic changed. Who knows, the frame not, might not be ready for something else to be rendered yet. So this allows us to keep those separated without anything too crazy. So all we have to do here is say ecs.update systems rendering pipeline and yeah, we need, still need frame time here though. That's still correct for the delta. Not that it really matters. We shouldn't be doing too much with delta anyways. But there you go. So with this, can we do something interesting to try and get... Actually, I can go ahead and get rid of this temporarily. Can we do something interesting to try and, yeah, render our entity? Well, sensibly enough, we'll want a renderable mesh. I'll call it renderable mesh. Sure. What we're going to do is we're going to set the vertex array of this to the address of our current vertex array. We also want render the bull mesh. We also want the texture equals to the texture. Because we have currently have a vertex array and a texture, we're just gonna send them straight to the renderable mesh. And we're gonna add that to our list. We're gonna also add a renderable mesh to our entity when we create it. There you go. Let's see what happens. Make and run. We get an error. One moment. Okay, and there are just a few typos. Namely, renderable mesh. Obviously, that's a renderable mesh component, not some magic renderable mesh that doesn't exist. So, yeah, there's that. Renderable mesh system needs to take in our game render context. That's important. And beyond that, in our context, sorry, not context. Yeah, our renderable mesh system. There it is. What we're going to do is we're going to change transform .to matrix to transform arrow to matrix because the transform is a, com a component. So actually, I screwed that up doubly because we need transform arrow transform .to matrix. There you go. This gets us the transform in the transform component and earns that into a matrix, which is exactly what we want. Now, if I make and run, we get absolutely nothing. So, of course, something's wrong. We're going to find out what this is. We will get to the bottom of this. And it turns out it was absolutely nothing. I just accidentally commented out the rendering code. So uh, if you actually leave the rendering code enabled, it works. Go figure. It's like a mind-blowing concept. Who would have thought? <laughs> but yeah, when you have that, everything works. So we can delete this commented out code, and look at this. Our scene update has simplified to a single call to update systems. Look at our render code. Simplified to a single call to clear and update systems. Are you starting to see a pattern here? Because this is a common simplification pattern we're going to start seeing over and over and over again. We also have some unused variables. We don't need X position and Y position anymore, and we no longer need the entity as a variable. So look at that, our code is just simplifying itself by virtue of using entity component systems. It is awesome. So, at this point, we can do something really cool. Now, everything is moved into the main ECS system, which means we can create more entities really easily. No bizarre hacks, we can just create a straight up for loop, i equals zero, i is less than, let's say, 100, and we can create a whole bunch more entities just like the one we have. Now, I'm not going to go too overboard, though. What I'm going to do here is I'm just going to set translation to this, and I'm going to set a random x and y. There's two ways to do this. You can use the math randf function, and there's parameters. For example, you say between negative 5 and positive 5. And that's one way to do it. And that's perfectly valid. Alternatively, you could do it sort of the manual way, just call randf directly multiply by 10.0 minus 5.0 doesn't matter they both do 
exactly the same thing. So in fact, I'm going to do it the manual way just because that's what I feel like today. And there. So there you go. That's our random translation. And our renderable mesh will be exactly the same. So that's great. We're going to say ECS make entity transform component and renderable mesh. There you go. Now, if we make and run, we should see, yeah, we see a bunch of random monkey heads. And in fact, while I'm at it, just because I feel like it, I'm also going to do the same thing for the Z component and just add 20. So there you go. Now it's random in 3D. Not that we can really tell it that well, given that nothing's actually moving, but still. Hello, everyone. It is Benny from the future. I know. Crazy, right? I hail from the land of after the next video because it makes a marginally better demonstration of what I want to show you. So let's go ahead and build and run right now. If you build and run right now, you'll see we have exactly the same scene as before, just the monkey heads are replaced with cubes because they're marginally well, not marginally, they're a much, much simpler piece of geometry. Just, you know, 12 triangles. And I've also disabled frame limiting. So now you can see we are rendering at, we're taking just about four, yeah, just about like 400 microseconds, a little bit under, to render a frame. Which is pretty good. That's a pretty good speed. But let's try increasing the number of cubes we have. Let's add say, a thousand cubes in our world. Not too unreasonable, right? And if you notice, we're already up to four milliseconds per frame. Hmm. If I increase this even to just 5,000 cubes, then just with that, we've killed it. We're already under 60 frames per second, can't possibly maintain it. That's not very good. Keep on, these are just cubes. They're not very complicated. The same general point will get across if you're using the monkey head, but the thing about the monkey head is it's a pretty high poly mesh, so you'd probably hit geometry limits before you hit the limit of what I'm trying to illustrate here, which is the issue of draw calls. If you do one draw call for every single thing in your game world, you have a pretty thin limit of what you can have in your game. 5,000 things at a time. Granted, that's not the worst thing in the world. That's definitely workable. But I mean, consider something like Minecraft, which renders millions of cubes per frame. You know, that's it's not good. I mean, granted, those cubes have limitations like being axis aligned and mostly static, but still, there, that allows optimizations. But even still, even if we ignore those limitations, still want to keep it totally arbitrary, we can definitely do a lot better than 5,000 cubes. And it's probably not nearly as difficult as you might think it is. So how can we do this? How can we overcome this limitation of our render pipeline and get, well, better performing renderer? How can we render potentially tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of cubes per frame? Find out next time. I hope you enjoyed, I hope you learned, and I will see you in the next video. As always, if you want to talk more with me or other like-minded people, Please join the Benny Discord. It is an awesome place and everyone is welcome. If you like these videos and want to support them or just want to find out right now, consider becoming a supporter on Patreon. Special thank you to my Patreon supporters and very special thank you to those listed in the video descriptions for being amazing and making these videos possible. Thank you.